Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sashin, and today's topic is one that everybody has an opinion on. Uh, it, it is about tipping. Is tipping a reward, a supplement, or an imposition? You know, it's one of those topics that everybody has an opinion. But before we go into the topic, let's, dis let's introduce our panel. Steve, why don't you start? Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Clark. I'm president and CEO of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association. All right, Greg. Hi, my name is Greg Kligman. I am an attorney at Elnoff, Grossman & Scholl uh, in the Labor and Employment Practice Group. Okay, and Glenn. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Grinlinger. I am an attorney at Fox Rothschild in its New York Labor and Employment Practice. Okay, and last but not least, Chris. Hey, Christopher Schiraldi. I, uh, I'm a floor manager at Cafe Silvium in Stanford, Connecticut. Okay. So, we've introduced, we've introduced the panel. Let's start talking. Um, tipping. Tipping. You know, I just read a survey done by Bankrate in 2024. 66% of Americans now look at uh, tipping as a negative. And, and, and who could help? But feel that way. Yeah, you know, every place you go, you, you swipe your credit card and the bottom of the credit card, they ask you for a tip for the person who's doing their job. I mean, it used to be waiters. It used to be people that helped you out with something. Now, the person at Starbucks who pulls a lever to pour you a cup of coffee is asking you for a tip. Um, what is going on here? How how did this get like this? Steve, why don't you start and discuss this? Yeah, so, I mean, you talk about the the evolution of tipping, and, and I'll focus on the restaurant industry specifically just to get started. But um, if you think about it traditionally, you know, you always had your, your full service operation where you sit down at the table, the server comes over, you order your food, you enjoy your food, you have a great experience, you pay the bill at the end. Um, and then we kind of saw this evolution into to quick service. And historically, you know, going back uh, when people started buying coffees, et cetera, outside of the house, they would go and make a transaction and they would get change. And they didn't want to carry the change in their pocket. So they would drop it in the cup that was on the counter. And that was kind of what it was. Um, we've evolved from that quarter and that nickel in the cup uh, to the change you didn't want to carry around to an actual conversation around where are we tipping and and to take it out of the restaurant industry i think a lot of it kind of uh hit full tilt post pandemic or mid pandemic because there was so many different services that were happening and i think people wanted to help out those that were working and those that were not working and how could they be helpful to those that were um necessary workers and were out there keeping our lives running was we wanted to reward them with with a little extra money or how could we be helpful or thank you for doing this and it's one of those things it hasn't gone away and so pardon the bad pun but we're kind of at a tipping point now uh where we're starting to question ourselves of when are we supposed to tip where are we supposed to tip and i think it's a great conversation to have today i just had my garage door have to get fixed and it was not an inexpensive process and my wife is texting me she's like should i tip him and i'm like I have no idea. I mean, we're paying, paying a lot of money for him to do this service. You know, are we supposed to tip on it? So I think it's a great conversation to have today of kind of kind of where we are. One other point I just want to add, which kind of makes it a little more confusing to the public, is we're so credit card heavy right now. And it almost makes it, if we go back to cash, the conversation becomes easier. It almost like it becomes our decision when we're using cash rather than, signing the tablet when it's in front of me or signing it when it happens. So it's an interesting place we're in as a society, but I really think that that's led to most of the problem is the credit card part of it. And, and the restaurateurs on the panel would talk about uh, the increased cost of credit cards. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting place we're in, in terms of tips with credit cards and how we're paying and, and how we're consuming services. Okay. I just want to uh, jump on that. I think that's the real um, key that, that's why things have changed so much in the last five years or so is, is the credit card. It's really easy to 
just put a line on a credit card slip. Somebody signs it. They're not really thinking about the the cost because they're not it's not physically coming out of their wallet and they're seeing the cost much later when they get the credit card bill and it it's a real easy way to um from the employer's perspective to reward employees giving them a little cash without having to um increase your uh the employer's costs and it's it's kind of almost a manipulative way to um get the customer to pay a little bit more for the goods and services that are provided. And it's easy to do that with the credit card. Well, it, uh, on top of that, you also have the guilt factor of with everyone on an iPad now and the person holding it in front of you and waiting to see which tab that you select uh, with a tip at a lot of times places you would never have even considered leaving a tip in the past. Yes, it's the kill factor. Well, and, and ballparks and arenas are at the top of that list. I mean, you're in a concession line now, and they put a put a, a pad in front of you, and, and they're asking you for a tip. Yeah. The interesting part about that at the uh, arenas, I've, I've had conversations with, with people that work in the arenas, and, you know, historically, someone may, pours a, a beer for you, someone hands you a hot dog, you might leave a dollar, two dollars, et cetera. You know what it doesn't it doesn't say dollar two dollar three dollar it says 15 percent 20 percent 25 percent uh and a lot of the ballpark and arenas the, the union contracts actually negotiated that where it would be a percentage not a a strict dollar amount so it's a kind of a fascinating subset of what's come out of that so let me let me just stop for a second here and let me get chris involved in this because chris is the person whose livelihood depends on the tips how does all this tipping the tip weariness that people have that every time they turn around somebody's asking them for a tip how does this affect your weekly paycheck chris because you're out there hustling and you're out there in the pits you're out there hustling for your tips why don't you enlighten us with that yeah, you know, uh, so my my restaurant's a little old schooler, I would like to say. We don't really have the, uh, the 15, 20, 25 percent screens in front of you. Um, I will chew your ear off until you just leave me more money. So, you you know, I'll leave you alone. That's like one of my go to's. Um, but I was just thinking uh, when you guys were you know going back and forth that in Europe. You know, you're the, the owners paid the workers. A full salary practically or you know they maybe you'll tip a dollar euro here or euro there uh so when i see people come in i don't really expect a tip from anybody you know i we do have a very tight clientele um you know where i'm just trying to get at is is unless i'm blowing you away with great service you know i i would you know i expect at least 15 percent right because that's what i'm accustomed to um but like you guys said, if I'm buying a beer for twenty six dollars at a football game, am I going to tip twenty percent on just that beer? Um, that's a little outlandish to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And now, on top of tips, there are service fees. You you mm. need to have a bookkeeping degree to read your 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 bill. Um, you have a you have three percent to the kitchen. Uh, three and a half percent or four percent for your credit card. Um, how does this? In, first of all, will somebody please define a service fee to the audience and how it different? It's different yeah. than a tip. I'm happy to. Uh, I'll take. We'll, the we'll, let Glenn, an, we'll let Glenn answer that because it's called World Yacht. <laughs> <laughs> well that would be for new york but uh steve if you want to you're, yeah, you're so i'm happy and, I, and I know our legal friends will correct me when i'm wrong uh you know but from the operator's perspective you do have to be careful what you call it because there are different requirements and into how you share it so or how it's treated so traditionally a service fee and i can only speak for massachusetts regulations but traditionally a service if you call it a tip a service charge or a gratuity any of those names it has to go to a wait staff employee. What you're seeing recently in the restaurant industry is the kitchen appreciation fee, the 3% that goes to the back of the house. And what that is at, at its core is the tipped employee in a full service restaurant is generally the highest earner in the restaurant. That tipped employee is probably making 30, 40, $50 an hour, depending on the operation. 
there's a there's actually a rule in restaurants where the front of the house can't count their tips in, in front of the back of the house. So if you follow tip laws, and I assume most restaurants uh, do, and we aspire them to do that, you cannot share the tips with the back of the house employees. So so the, the first simple question is, well, just raise prices to give them more money. Here's the thing. Most people tip on the menu price. So it's indexed to inflation. So you're always tipping more when menu costs go up. So the 3 and 4% fee is the operator's way to try to direct some more money toward the back of the house staff without having to raise prices and therefore raising the tips that go to the tipped employee. So that's the, the attempt. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, we think back, uh, this was back in 2016, we started talking about this and it really depends on your operation and who your clientele is. But we started talking, we started seeing those type of fees pop up in certain areas in Massachusetts. And I don't I don't want to I don't want to assume where the audience is from, but you know, if you think Boston, Cambridge, kind of left leaning, higher income places in Massachusetts was where we first started seeing those fees. And we would go out and have operator roundtables in other parts of the city and other parts of the state. And I actually got booed out of the room when I when I just brought it up as a conversation out in Worcester, which is more blue collar <laughs> price sensitive people. And the operator said, we would never do that. That would never happen. How would that happen? Fast forward six, seven years later, they're calling us, hey, how do I put those fees on? Because I'm starting to see them everywhere. So, you know, the the evolution of fees is, uh, is fascinating, but that's really what the operator is trying to do is direct some more money to the back of the house people that cannot share in tips and cannot get tips without having the tip employees make more. Let me ask you a question. Now, if it's a fee like that that's added, does the owner operator have to pay workman's comp or any of the other things on that money brought in? They absolutely they have to collect sure. meals tax and, and taxes on it because it's it's essentially a it's a fee in lieu of raising prices. So yes. when it's when it's remitted to the employee as a wage, it would be subject to workers' comp, yes. Um and, and it's yeah. also, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, Steve, no, go, no, go I was ahead. Also saying, it's up. also, um, if that fee is then forwarded to the employees, it's it's calculated, it's incorporated into the calculation of overtime, which can make overtime a very complicated calculation to make on a weekly basis. Now, can the owner share in any of these service fees? So... In theory, they can. <laughs> and so in, Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, we have a requirement that basically says, and if you think about it, if it's a house fee, an administrative fee, or if you're at a wedding, um, you know, a cake cutting fee. In Massachusetts, if you discl disclose to the customer that it doesn't represent a tip, service charge, or gratuity, then you can do what you want with it. You can pay the light bill. You can pay the back of the house. You can put it in your pocket. Uh, generally these three or 4% kitchen appreciation fees, you know, I think you're running into some conflict with your employees. If you're not directing that 4% to the back of the house and, you know, disclosing and saying it, I think you're going to have an employee, uh, relationship issue. So you might be allowed to keep it, but technically you're allowed to keep it because you're giving it to the back of the house through payroll. So, but the, it, it, in Massachusetts, at least it's all in, in how you disclose it to the consumer. The you know, same back thing at the beginning needs. of the pandemic, I, I, I saw where they were raising the um, the the pay of, of workers and the waitresses and waiters in this session were complaining that they raised because they raised the uh, the uh, their wages and because they had to wait, raise the prices. Um, the people were tipping less. They were paying, if, if they used to tip a buck and a quarter on a burger, um, they still tipped a buck and a quarter on the burger or even less because the price of the, of the $15 burger was now $18 and they took it out of the waiter or waitresses. How does this coming, how does this work with you? I, I guess, Chris, there is no service charge for the kitchen, is there, in your place? There is no uh, service charge in, in the kitchen, though. So no. what so, happens when prices go up? Do, you, do your people still tip you the same? I would say it's, it's definitely more of a percent base. Um, you know, to touch back, you know, we closed down for six, seven months for the pandemic, and we started doing takeout only. 
Uh, and our business really took off at that point, takeout wise. Uh, when I came back to work, because I took a couple months off to be with the family and whatnot. So uh, we, I noticed, you know, I want to just throw some numbers out there. There's maybe one out of every 10 takeouts, there would be a tip. Now, at this point, I would say nine out of 10 takeouts have a tip, which is very, very surprising. And most of them are over, I would say, the 15 to 20 percent. A lot of people, they'll spend eighty dollars and they'll just leave a hundred, you know, and it's, it was that's definitely a covid related thing. So, yeah, that, that's interesting because in, um, in D.C., when they have um, started to eliminate the tip credit. Um, which we can get if, into if you'd like. But um, there's a report out recently that since they've um, started to phase out the tip credit, tips have actually gone down significantly in, in, in the District of Columbia. Um, and, you know, there might be a lot of reasons for that, but the consensus seems to be because of the rising costs and, and uh, customers believing that they don't have to tip to cover the tip credit anymore, tips are now going down. So why don't you why don't you take a second, uh, and Greg as well jump in and let's let's do sort of an overview on the tip credit and what that means and how that changes the the marketplace. Sure. So the tip credit uh, in certain in, in most states under certain circumstances, and an employer can pay a tipped employee uh, a cash wage that is lower than the minimum wage and take a credit towards the employee's anticipated tips. So for example, in New York, uh, in New York City, for example, um, you can currently pay an employee a cash wage of 1065, take a $5.35 credit towards the employee's anticipated tips, um, which would bring the employee uh, up to the minimum wage of $16 an hour. You can only you can only do that if if all tips meet meet the minimum. You know you are you're not allowed to come up short. That's a that's a state and federal law that the server Correct. has to make the tips well, you, in difference. Then there's also the 80, 20, 30 rule. If you're taking the tip credit, you got to make sure that they're spending at least eighty percent of their time doing tip producing work, and that that non tip producing work doesn't exceed twenty percent little wrinkle in new york law that you know 20 percent or two hours and you can never do more than 30 minutes at a go in non-tip generating work so that if means cleaning they, cleaning glassware uh rolling napkins, delivery, whatever it is exactly okay. if they violate that then you also can't can't take the tip credit and it's going to that to the and I, there's many different segments of the industry, but just to keep things simplified, there's the full service restaurant that we talked about where the server comes and takes your order. And there's the quick service restaurant. You order from a counter and you pay in advance before eating. Let's not get into all the different mosaics of the industry, but for, for these purposes, let's keep those two. The tip credit is a traditional um, mechanism used in full service restaurants. Generally, your coffee shop, your sub shop, your pizza shop you're not paying those employees a tip credit. You're not necessarily prohibited from doing that, but historically the business model is those employees are paid an hourly wage, a full hourly wage in a full service restaurant. Your dishwashers, your cooks, your managers are paid an hourly or salary wage while your tipped employees are paid the tip wage and they are able to retain the tips. Okay. So what about what about what about cities like uh, Chicago and and California cities that have eliminated the tip credit? What's the what's the feedback been? What's the thought process? Does, so, does it... so Chicago just did it recently, so we're yeah. just starting to see the impacts. Uh, same with D.C. that was mentioned earlier. Uh, it sounds that D.C. has been a disaster um, in terms of people crossing over the the river to go to Baltimore or Maryland because it's such a close proximity to other restaurants prices have gone up most restaurants have implemented a service charge now of equivalent of about 20 percent. it does and a number of restaurants have closed in dc uh that's not the sole reason there's other factors at play right. in washington dc but it can't be ignored chicago is relatively new it really only happened a couple weeks ago and it's a two-year phase out we'll see what happens with that 
And just to correct the record a little bit on California, California has never had a tip credit. Um, they when when they first authorized their minimum wage law, they said that there would be no tip credit there. So there's really no impact in terms of what's. I mean, Cal, we could talk about California cost to do business for for hours. Yeah. Um, I do know a number of full service restaurateurs from the East Coast that have gone to California have pulled out because the overall cost of doing business in California is so much higher than everywhere else. Uh, and, and so there, they kind of learn their lesson there. And there are a number of states out West that you cannot take the tip credit, Oregon, Alaska, uh, I think Nevada, Montana, Montana, <laughs> yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. So, so, so the states you would think. One thing, yeah, one of the things that's interesting also is that when you saw the DC thing uh, elimination introduced and you're seeing where it's being discussed in other states, a lot of the tipped workers are protesting against elimination of the tip credit because plenty of economists have looked at the issue and they note that it'll eliminate thousands of jobs. Um, and these tip workers know that there is the potential for operators to shut down um, eliminating jobs, and it would be an impact of loss of millions of dollars of wages in the economy, which is why you're seeing tipped workers protest against elimination. Steve we have, probably we, knows this better than I do, but that I think that happened in Maine, where the where the where the tipped workers basically lobbied to keep the tip credit. Absolutely, there was a situation in in Portland, Maine, where there was a a a, a vote to eliminate it. And immediately the service started seeing their their revenue go down and their earnings go down. And they they essentially marched on City Hall and, and they reversed the vote. Um, so we have a similar situation happening in Massachusetts. And I had a meeting the other day at a local restaurant and I pulled the owner aside and I said, hey, you know, we're going to be talking about tip wage and tip credit. Do you want your employees to hear what we're talking about? And he said, hold on. Hey, Drea. Do you want to give up your tips and make minimum wage? And uh, I'll keep this PG. She, she, I'll keep this PG rated for the morning audience. But she said, she said, "F no." Uh, I have a college degree, and I used to work in an office. And if my tips go away, uh, I want no part of it. So, and I said, but, you know, and that's that was unprompted. Uh, we hear from servers all the time that reach out to us and say, "You got to protect us. You got to save us. You got to you got to do something about this." So. Um, yeah, it's like any good, any good salesperson in any line of work, whether it's insurance, what, whatever you're selling. I mean, you 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 fight and battle for commission. Yeah, you don't absolutely. want them taken away. It's one so, of the it's one of the few hourly jobs that you can truly earn unlimited income. Yeah. You know, you could you could uh, serve as many customers as you can. You can have great service. You can wow them with food and drink, and you're uncapped in your earnings. Right. So it's, wow. So Chris, Chris, now that you found out you have you can have unlimited earnings and you're rolling in dough, how does any of this affect you? What do you what do you are you as confused as everybody else in the audience? Yeah, a little bit, I'd say. Um, I'm going to go talk to my boss and see if I get that minimum wage and, you know, just putter around and not really, you know, not even really uh, put any effort in. Maybe, maybe that uh, I'll save some energy that way. I'll be a little more arrested, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, like Fred said, you know, anybody that is really good at their job and has an opportunity to show their stuff and know that since I'm the best waiter in the place, I'm going to make more money than the other people. Um, why would you? <clears throat> the whole, you know, one, one of the things about hospitality and food service is hospitality. So if every but all your wait staff are drones earning a it doesn't make a difference. All they have to be is adequate to keep their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Show, yeah. Yep. show me the incentives, you know. Um, <laughs> now, I, we didn't bring this up, but, uh, you know, where I work, we pool. So we okay. all pool tips. And uh, is that better or worse? Uh, I wonder what business owners would say workers are obviously going to say worse right because they they want to be able to wow their best customers to make that 30 percent tip if someone's going to leave that much you know uh, does that make my busters and my food runners and my dessert guys work better as a team knowing that hey you know chris is out there 
doing his thing. So I'm going to do everything I can because he's doing his best. Or are they going to coast by because, oh, well, Chris is this, can or, you know, handled. So I don't really have to, you know. You know, it's interesting because then it throws the onus of hospitality from the waiter to the owner. Because now the owner has to hire people who um, will be able to excel so that top waiter Chris doesn't get frustrated because he says, I'm doing 80% of the work and only getting 30% of the tips because I'm splitting it with the other two people. Um, well, Larry, I have an interesting story about that. I ahead. have had multiple clients in the past month because of that issue, as of January 1st, they actually shifted from a tip pool to a ship, uh, tip share, um, recognizing how much is being placed on the servers nowadays. And the servers were kind of revolting against participating in a ship uh, tip pool. So the operators did shift it from, uh, from a pool to a share policy where the servers are retaining a higher percentage of their tips. So it's, give, a, give a little basic definition on the difference between a pool and a share. Yeah. So a tip pool, all the servers, and depending on the operation, sometimes the bartenders basically put all the tips into one pot and it gets divvied out based upon the formula that you establish. A tip share, the servers will keep their tips, the bartenders will keep their tips, but kick in a portion of that to a pool where the sub uh, categories of support staff will divvy up that amount between themselves. Yeah, uh, it's... You know, so the problem, the problem with tip share historically has been that uh, those employees that get the money in the in the, the servers in that example are not always honest. So if you say you got a tip ten percent, you know, in the to share for the busboys, the the barbacks, etc., um, if it's on credit card, you can't you can't play the game. But if it's cash, they do play the game. So you know, there there's that problem. You know, I think one of the problems we have to realize, and I think it, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, is that this is a cultural shift. And no matter any time you make a change to people's compensation, you're changing culture. And and if you look back to this experiment before the pandemic, you know, Danny Meyer tried it. Danny Meyer tried it. He went to no tipping and, and you can and tip included, I should say. And, and I think there were a couple of issues. Issue number one, from a customer standpoint, is that you walked into a restaurant and all of a sudden, if you were paying $50 today on an average check, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you walked in tomorrow, you were paying $60. They couldn't get it through their heads. Even though there was no tipping line on the on the, the, the check, um, they couldn't get the fact that he took that 10% and it was not hidden, forget the legalities. Yeah. It was quite the opposite. And he was gonna take that 10% and he was gonna split it with everyone. In fact, you couldn't even tip the person in the coat check. Um, it worked for a short time, but the problem became on the flip side of it from the employee standpoint. His part of his rationale was you all will get the same amount of money. But again, as a couple of times this has come up in conversation, the person that worked Friday and Saturday night that used to make $350 was now making $250. You made the same $250 on Monday night but you never made the 350 again. So the, the person that was, his rationale was I could I could put good waiters or my best servers on a Monday night or a Tuesday night without worrying about it. But again, you were taking money out of their pocket. To, to, and it was also done in a fit. It was also done with a fixed price menu, which is a, a, a huge caveat it, with that it, as well. It also created, a, there was also overtime, yeah. uh, administrative overtime issues as well, because the right. money got added into overtime and that created a big, back end problem. Yeah, so it, it got it got to be a, a huge mess. And a number of the major restaurateurs in New York that tried it um, have, to, to Glenn's point, have pulled away from it because of some of the administrative nightmares of it. I think the only way it works is if you're starting a new restaurant and you start it from the beginning and you say, this is what we're going to do because you're not trying to break the old ways of doing things. And, and as everybody said from the beginning, 
look, I work in the private club sector. We don't have this problem because the vast majority of private clubs um, don't pay tip. It, it, it's just real straightforward. Um, and so we've not dealt with this problem. Um, we deal with it on a real small scale at times, but it, it's pretty minor. But it is the bane of everybody's existence today, no matter what segment you are. Like you said, somebody said, you go to the self-service checkout line at CVS and it asks you if you want to put a tip. And I, I just, I'm mind boggled by who the corporate person was at CBS that decided that was a good idea. Um, anyways. Well, I think it's indicative of what technology is doing to every aspect of life in general. I mean, I went to the National Retail Federation show at the Javits last week. And, you know, clearly uh, if they had their way, uh, your kitchen would be all droned out, all ro all robots, uh, you know, with everything being done with a, with, with a hydraulic arm. You know, without without any uh, people at all. So but, you know, one thing we is, yeah, one thing ahead. we haven't talked about is the increased amount percentage of tips. I mean, it used to be, you know, 15, 20 percent was normal. You know, you go into a back of a New York City cab, and it's been this way for a number of years now, and you get to the end of your ride, and um, it asks you to put in a tip, and it's not 15, 18, or 20 percent. I believe it was 20, 25 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in other circumstances in um, in some quick service places where they're asking you to pay, you know, 20, 25, 30 percent on someone that just handed me whatever the coffee yeah. or the muffin that you I, know, it's that I interesting. bought. It's interesting that you say that. Tim Gannon, unmute yourself. Tell me when you're there, Tim. Tim. I'm there. There it is. Ask the panel your question that you chatted with Fred and myself about tipping. This comes, up, this comes up almost every single time that I go out to dinner with friends. And my son and his girlfriend are adamant about this. My question is, um, do you tip on the entire bill or do you tip just on the food costs? And I'm telling you, this is like, it's gotten heated. I know what I do. And my dad, going back, my dad said, I don't, I subtract right. alcohol from the bill. I don't tip on alcohol, just the food. Well, I don't agree with that. So I food and alcohol. I tip on food and alcohol, eliminate the tax. But I'm a generous tipper, and it probably turns out to be the same if you tip I, on the tax. But what do you I do? I do what you do, Tim. I take out the tax. But I tip on the me. whole thing. I tip on the whole thing. What are you taking the dollar? You run a restaurant association. That's before. why. What do you guys, <laughs> what, why do you want to do math at the end of dinner and have to divide different things? Take the, the sub, the sub total. I'm, right I'm good at, well, I'm good at math. 20%, <laughs> right easy math, with. easy decimal. What are you taking the couple dollars away from the server for? Come on. Yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting that the, this, it's the, is, this is. the general consensus is that there is no consensus on what to do with that. You, 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 and I mean, I know, I know what Chris wants you to do. He wants you to, you know, to triple the tax, and 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 that's his, that's his, <laughs> that's his tip. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, I am a, you know, say for instance, I am a middle class guy. I got my family of myself, my wife, and my four kids, and they're all boys, and they're eating up half the restaurant. And I have a nine to five job. And then all of a sudden, uh, I, I, why should I feel generous to the, you know, the extra bucks has to stick in my pocket. Is there a guideline anymore? No, as evidenced by the conversation, we got four different answers. So there, there is no guideline. But. It, well, it's there's, a, and there's, a fifth, there's a fifth answer. What do you do if you buy a really expensive bottle of wine? Because that, that one gets really complicated. Okay, I do 20%. But, you know, if I'm out on a special occasion and it's my wife and I and I just dropped 250 bucks on a bottle of wine, that's a $50 tip, you know, on a, on a just on the bottle of wine. And you know what? If I'm in a restaurant of that level, it really doesn't bother me. If I'm in a restaurant where the restaurant, it's the top of the wine list, then I'm like, am I really getting the service? So it gets really complicated. Yeah, it, it, it's what's, what's your experience and what's your level of hospitality that you're hoping to get? So, you know, it, I, are you going to tip? different at a high-end steakhouse versus your 
Tuesday night dinner with a couple people, you might, you know, it's, 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 it's what you're, what you're hoping to gather from that experience. But I don't know. I just don't want to do extra math. So I just keep it right. Um, you know, all of a sudden you're getting into local meals tax and what's the percentage of that, et cetera. I don't know. On a 7% tax in Massachusetts on a hundred dollar bill, it's a dollar and 40 cents. So, um, you know, that's, that's why I, uh, so see, I can do math, we're letting common but I don't sense want to do math. Right. Right. Don't let common sense confuse. In Massachusetts, right. you have a local tax on top of it. It's a separate line item. Correct. We have, we have a, um, a 6.25% sales tax, which applies to meals and then local municipalities can add a 0.75%. Um, the vast majority shocking have done it. Um, and interestingly enough, we have a proposal that came out yesterday from the governor to increase the local option percentage. Um, but yeah, so so all in, it's a seven percent tax, but it's 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 divided uh, six point two five on on the state and point seven five on the local. I guess when you live in New York, the, the percentage of sales tax is just higher than all of those put together. So I, you don't have to yeah. worry about local. But I just didn't realize you had a separate line item for local. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Herrera, where are, where are you with tipping at this point? Peter runs a large operation in White Plains, New York. What What's going on from a tipping standpoint? What changes are you seeing? Oops. Just hit on mute. You there? Guess not. Okay, we'll go back. I'm here. Sorry I'm about here. that. Okay. Um, It's funny. I've been listening all morning and... I, it's one of those comments, yes, no, and maybe. Yeah. I think common sense prevails. I think super, you make me feel good. I want to share that good feeling. I've been to coffee shops um, that I have tipped $5 for a cup of coffee and a croissant. Um, and the best comment I will tell you, I had a police officer uh, behind me and I wanted to buy his in Yonkers, New York. I got to tell you. Hats off to these cops. This is the fourth cop who's done it, has had this response to me at a local coffee shop. He goes, guy, we just wanted to buy him a cup of coffee. Say thank you. I goes, thank you, but no thank you. You could tip your server. So I look at the server. I said, okay, thank wow. you very much. I look at the server. I said, just so we understand, this $5 is because that police officer um, said to tip you. Wow. I, I we have coffee shops and cafes and hospitals, full service restaurant. I think the system is set up for restaurants to be tipped. They're salesmen, they're superstars in service. I'm sorry. I just don't see it at regular coffee shops, mechanics. And don't misunderstand me. Do I bring my mechanic, you know, four coffee cups, two or three times a year, hot when it's cold, cold when it's hot. They appreciate that so much more than $20, believe it or not. Um, I think we're dancing around the the tax ramifications. Um, and the waiters, I got to tell you, I think it's a tough job. It's a tough job to work two to three hours for lunch. I think it's a tough job running around. Um, how much are you gonna, money are you going to make tonight? I don't know, 100, 200. I don't know too many workers that would do that. Now, to answer the question of tipping to the kitchen, when we throw a party, a private party in the restaurant, we stated on our menu, three, it's, uh, we charge 21%, 2% goes to administrative, 3% goes to the kitchen, and the staff makes uh, 16%. Our regular per person average is, uh, for lunch is 30, uh, 31, dinner is 40. A private party is $60 a person. 16% of that is a whole lot more than 20% of $30. So, and they are, they're guaranteed the money. So in our world, we share the private party business with the kitchen. I will say this, I give the kitchen a lot of credit. You have the chef, the sous chef, grillman, dishwasher, sanitation. They get a, they probably get about 60 to $70 a week in gratuities, cash. Guess how they split it evenly amongst them all. It's a pool system. There's not a hierarchy. I give them a lot of credit. Uh, and 
but we treat our back of the house very differently. And what I mean by that is they cook for family meal every day. I have barred staff from eating family meal. If they don't ask the kitchen, would you like a cup of coffee or a soda? So they can cook for you all day long, but you can't get them a wow. hot beverage, a soda, one thing or another. And I say it publicly. I probably will be sued for it someday. But I'd like to see the judge say, I have cooks that cook for the front of the house staff. But the front of the house staff, they're not paying for the soda, the cappuccino. I am. But can yeah. you bring it to them in a 95-degree kitchen? Wow. That, that's my spiel. Sorry. It's a great story. Peter, Peter with, your, uh, with your back of the house making that choice, do you direct them? Do you give them any guidance at all? Or do you just say it's up to you no. guys to figure out? How do you um, direct that conversation? <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely not. The lawyer's on the line. Um, it is a gratuity. So how they decide how to um, divvy it up is strictly up to them. We vote once a year if okay. it's going to be a pool house or, and it's funny, we've gone back and forth. We've changed actually the percentages of the pool. It used to be 12% went to the pool. You kept everything above 12%. Um, it was 15% at one point. Now it's 100% individual. I will say, Steve, we've done that because the, um, how do I say this? The level of professionalism and service in the front of the house, I have never seen such a disparity of okay with an attitude and phenomenal with an attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. I think that's like the 80-20 rule on any on any sales staff, on any staff doing anything, on any ball club, on, on any kind of organization, right? Um, I, th I think it's I, unrealistic. It's Go worse. I, I, I've never seen it this way. In right. the last four years, I apologize. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But when we were a pool house, I got to tell you, we trained and trained the wow factor. And the top waiters were actually helping train everybody. And when the top waiters snapped at you, like a sheepdog, Will, the lamb, yeah. and the waiter, the other waiter, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's sharing your tips. We post, we used to, we're going to do it again now. We would post your per person average, by the way, and your sales every shift. Interesting. So Fred, you're at 32.95. Uh, Larry, you're at 37. Steve, you're at 40. You're killing it, buddy. And all right, uh, low man on totem pole, Fred, we got to talk. You're, low, you're dragging down the team, yeah. and it's a pool house. Yeah, I will tell you, I loved it. I miss it. Uh, it is not in my privy of responsibilities anymore. I've stepped away from the restaurant somewhat uh, because we've gotten more into cafes that serve hospitals. Yeah. Um, food service. <laughs> Who would have thought? I ever would have thought it was a great business. Um, but I agree with you, Fred. But when it was a pool house, they really took care of each other. But to the entire panel, everybody on the phone call, I think this is a cultural thing. In our building, I let the sheep dogs out. And if they bit you on, on they bit a lamb on the rum, were you falling in line? Now, don't draw blood. Don't leave scars. <laughs> okay? Yeah. No, you got to be careful. I mean, remember, I'm going to use a, a, a word that I love. My top people were all immigrants. They were top, man. They they were head of households. They had two jobs. They were hustling constantly. Yeah. We have a top waiter that was started with us 26 years ago as a back waiter. He now has three co-ops, three kids, and they're going to college. He has three co-ops from the being a waiter. It's the old New York waiter. City waiter store. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Immigrant immigration and immigrant, I think, is a beautiful word. We get the best and the brightest. And if not, they work twice as hard as everybody else. Just because our system, and I go back to culture and system, is not working as a government with immigration. Um, we can't blame the people. It's like you can't blame people for tipping right. and making this a whole issue now. And now we have to deal with it as a restaurateur. I'm sorry, you shouldn't be tipping somebody. You're paying $100, $195. I don't tip my plumber. I'll get you a cup of coffee. So 
so do we see as a panel do we see an opportunity for a wave of immigration to want to at some point get figured out to be able to come into our industry or do we see tech yes mr gannon well, I had a question. I think Peter, it was for Peter, and I think he actually answered it. My question was going to be, um, how much of the back end, uh, you know, the, the sharing that that they do within with their tips, the even sharing, how much of that has to do with culture? And I think you you at, indirectly answered it. it is kind of an immigrant culture where they're trying, they're all trying to uh, help the other one get a leg up. Yep. Yes, I, I agree. I, I think it's culture. But it's our, our culture. I don't mean to say it. I want to be careful how I'm going to say this. We're not. I, I'm first generation Cuban. I oh, so speak, is my wife. Oh, my condolences. <laughs> Toughest women I've ever met. She's a fireball. <laughs> um, we're not allowed to speak Spanish on the floor or in cafes. And I'll make you laugh. My own people, I'm going to say Latinos, I've turned when my back is turned. And they say it in Spanish, that racist gringo. I turn, I'm like, yeah. in Spanish, ¿Qué, ¿qué gringo te está molestando? And they're like, no, 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 it was, it, it was that guy over there. I'm like, okay. Uh, and they're like, you speak Spanish? No, I'm Cuban. If I didn't speak Spanish, uh, my mother would have beaten me. The, uh, when I always love this, it's culture. Well, why didn't you say so? Uh, I'm straight, I have three daughters. I'm 61 years old. They're like, huh? Exactly. What my what my language or nationality is is irrelevant. It's yeah. a culture. We take care of each other. Yeah. If a customer comes up and can't speak English, oh, open up whatever language. We are a, our culture is about taking care of people, hospitality, respite. So, to answer your uh, uh, short uh, short answer, long ways. Some of it, I think, is culture but it's set by management and ownership. When I bring everybody cappuccinos and I remember how they take one sugar, two sugars, you know, I think we have a responsibility of setting the tone in our industry. And we have to be careful with tipping because it's going to get diluted. And if you just serve me, I shouldn't say that. You serve me a cup of coffee, you're super polite and cheery. 20%, 25%, because it's only five bucks. So I take back uh, what I just said. Okay. Okay, guys. You know, it's, it's that time uh, when time has become our enemy. And by the way, you know, George Burns once said he had the easiest job in the world. He would get on and ask, say, hey, Gracie, tell me about your cousin Fred. And Gracie would talk for 45 minutes. Peter, thank you, Gracie. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, I'm going to unmute. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> oh, it's funny. It's funny. Oh, the best, Peter. You're the best. Hey, you know, um, we're going to do our closing statements uh, after this. But uh, first, what I want to do is go around the room. And I'd like everyone in the panel to leave their one final idea that you want to leave with our leave our audience and the people who will listen to this recording after so steve why don't you start i don't know i, I would have done some homework if i had to impart some words of wisdom i'll keep it simple patronize your local restaurant um you know we need you they're out there working hard uh still haven't recovered from the uh pandemic uh new costs new challenges happen every day uh, everyone thinks of the restaurant industry on Friday night when they can't get a seat. Uh, the restaurant industry on Wednesday morning when there's nobody in the restaurant and the toilet breaks and the person has to fix it. Patronize your local restaurant as much as you can, and uh, you're you're helping your community and you're helping the people that uh, live live work, live with live near you uh, by keeping those employees employed. Because as Peter said, the story of our industry is uh, is the path to middle class and beyond. And uh, you don't need a Harvard degree to be very successful in our industry. And we're one of the few industries where that can happen. So patronize your local restaurant. Thank you. Thank you. Greg. Uh, I would just say from the legal perspective, you know, if you're an operator, make sure you're complying with the 80-20-30 rule. Make sure you're doing the minimum wage and overtime calculations correctly. You don't want to... Uh, 
create wage and hour issues for yourself based upon the tip credit. Okay, thank you. Glenn. Um, didn't realize there would be homework here. I would say um, keep make sure you're aware of what's going on at your state and local government levels and how that how changes in the law or what's being proposed is going to impact your business. Um, especially, for example, here in New York, we're seeing strong efforts to try to get rid of the tip credit, for example. And if that's going to impact your business negatively, get involved and try to work with um, you know, people like Steve to, to help you uh, make sure that they keep the tip credit in place. All right. And Chris? So a two-part. Um, one would be do not hire any robots to run your <laughs> restaurant. Thank, that's number one. Thank you. I appreciate you. And um, number two would be try not to set up a call at before 930 after someone's worked two doubles and they'll be a little <laughs> more bubbly, a little more bubbly. I promise next time. Um, yeah. All right. Well, you were bubbly enough. Yeah. Thank you. I bubbly enough. It, it, worth at least an 18% tip on this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not 20, but. Funny, but... Take out the uh, tax, and then you'll be Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, jeez. Thanks, everybody, for coming by today. Uh, we will be back in two weeks when we will honor our first class of our Hall of Fame. We will be honoring uh, Peter Herrero, who you heard today. We'll be honoring Joyce Appleman and Yvonne Lemoine. Uh, three people who have helped the virtual breakfast session stay afloat last year uh, while we were still finding our way. So I look forward to seeing you all in two weeks. Fred, do you have anything last to say? Nope. Thanks, everybody, for participating. I guess the only thought today would be don't let uh, technology get in the way of common sense. Yes. I think that's really the, the lesson out of this. Yeah. Don't be intimidated yep. by a by a pad uh tip tip your heart yep. not 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 uh, the intimidation factor Man. and uh you know money was the thing we demanded good service and for good service we paid yep. a tip so if you use that as a guideline as as instead of the <laughs> lemming factor uh you will feel good about your tipping so that answers your question tim um you know tip your heart not your not the lemming factor and um two things to say one of which i did not um, pay heed to the only two things i have left to say is everybody stay positive test negative amen and thanks we'll everybody weeks. have a great Bye day now, thank you thank you nice to meet Bye. you guys